Why doesn't it work? 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 So I'll often come in on Fridays and try to get it working so that I know. So chapter 24. There were a few questions submitted. Uh, I went through all the questions and wrote up the lecture notes yesterday around 4 or 5 o'clock. So everything that was submitted by then should be answered. If you submit it after that, Sorry. you need to set up office hours. Okay. Uh, if these don't answer your questions. So one of the first questions was uh, check up, I think it was 24.2. And it had to do with um, Gauss's law, which tells us the electric flux is equal to integral of E dot dA. So it seems like if I'm figuring out the flux that's going through something, uh, it should depend on this area. Right? So if I change the radius, change the size of the surface I'm going through, something should change here. But the nice thing about Gauss's law, and this is apparently true, we can't really get into why it's true. It has to do with um, fundamentals of how electromagnetism works. It takes a few more lessons before we can really get into that. Um, but apparently this is how electromagnetism works. Flux is always equal to the integral of E dot dA, which is always equal to charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Always. If you have a closed surface, so you'll only deal with closed surfaces. So what this means is even if the area changes, if I increase the radius or decrease the radius and I change this, the electric field is then also going to change. So that you always get Q over epsilon naught. Which is a fundamental result of how electricity seems to work. It has to do with something that we'll study more of called Maxwell's equations. A physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, came up with these four equations that describe uh, electromagnetism. This is one of them. So, no matter what, if your surface is closed and isolated, you're always going to have a flux that's equal to the charge of closed over epsilon now. No matter what you do to the area, no matter what you do to the electric field. That made that trick up, that uh, checkup was kind of tricky because of that. All right, so we also asked about uh, problem 33 and 39 and 61 and what electric flux actually is. So to cover what electric flux is, um, give me a hook. Electric flux, this is the flux of E dot What that means, what we're really figuring out here, uh, let's say I have an electric field that I'm setting up, a whole bunch of little electric field lines. The flux is telling me how many little electric field lines are passing through a surface area. So if this is my thing that I'm passing through, this is my surface, I can take the area of this, multiply it by the number of electric field lines that are going through this. That's the electric flux. Electric field lines going through something with perpendicular. That's why we take the dot product. The dot product gets things that are perpendicular. So that's the definition of electric flux. That's kind of the example that I was talking about in the video. You just have a sheet, you're counting how many lines go through that sheet. That's the electric flux. Electric field lines going through a surface. And what we do typically is we use. Um, different shapes to calculate this. So number 33 we'll start with to go deep into Gauss's law. In number 33 we have a spherical shell. So the inner radius of that shell is A. The outer radius of the shell is B. And we have a bunch of charge in here. The charge is evenly spread around throughout this whole volume. So what letter represents charge divided by volume? Hold it a moment. Rho. Rho represents charge over volume. Rho 
is the charge divided by the volume. And in general, for a spherical shell, what would the volume of a spherical be, uh, of a uh, surface air, uh, bleh, what would <laughs> the volume of a sphere be? Four thirds times pi times r cubed. That is in general going to be the case. The volume of a sphere is that. I think what makes Gauss's law hard isn't necessarily the physics, it's all the geometry that goes into it and knowing these formulas. So that's what I'm trying to make them a little bit more clear. Now we're asked to find uh, in part A, B, and C what are the um, electric fields inside of this? So in a radius less than A, inside of this whole shell, a radius uh, between A and B, and outside of the whole thing. So we're asked to find what are the electric fields for all these different situations. Part A is pretty straightforward. I want to know the electric field. I can use Gauss's law. Gauss's law says the integral of E times the surface area is equal to Q inside over epsilon naught. Down, move it over. So what I need to do first is I need to draw a Gaussian surface that represents the area that I'm talking about, the region that I'm talking about. I'm talking about inside of the inner shell. So R has to be less than A. So I'm going to draw a little dotted line that represents that. Tiny, tiny little R, less than A. So I'm inside of this inner shell. R could be a little bit bigger. R can get all the way out to A. It could be a little bit smaller. It could be zero. But anywhere inside of this region. Now to figure out the electric field, I can take the left-hand side. What kind of Gaussian surface am I drawing? Remember, the left-hand side is all about the Gaussian surface. Uh, well, I have an electric field, and then I have the integral of dA. What is dA? What is the surface area of that surface I just drew? It's spherical. 4 pi r squared. So the left-hand side is E times 4 pi r squared. And now comes the hard part, figuring out what Q in is. So the right-hand side is all about the charge. How much charge is inside of that little green line that I drew? How many charges do you see inside of there? None? So what's the charge inside of there? Zero. Zero. So what's E times 4 pi r squared equal to? Zero divided by epsilon naught. So what is the electric field on the inside of this? Zero, because there's no charge. Zero, because R is less than A. There's no charge in close to that. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I'm going to go to part C. I'm going to skip part B for now. And we're going to look at what's going on if we're outside of this whole thing. So there's A, there's B. Here's all my little charges floating around in there. In part C, we have a radius that's greater than B. So we're outside of this whole thing. So I'm gonna draw my little Gaussian surface, except this time I'm gonna be outside of the whole sphere. There's my radius. Gauss's log n, integral of E dot dA equals Q in over epsilon naught. Left hand side, E times dA, what does that give me? It's all about the surface. What kind of surface am I drawing? I'm drawing a sphere again. So what's my left hand side? E times four pi r squared. When will I get something different than E times four pi r squared? If I use a different shape. If I use a cylinder, if I use a flat sheet. Will that ever happen? If we have that spherical shape now, would it ever You have this spherical shape? You use a sphere. Okay. You'd need a different shape. I can give you a flat sheet of charge, then you'd use something different. 
Now, is this 4 pi r squared the same as the one above it? No, because this r is a little bit bigger, right? Represents the same thing, but it's a different one. So now comes the hard part. We have to figure out how much charge is inside of there. Because this is all equal to Q in over epsilon naught. And why is this equal to Q over epsilon naught? That's what physics says. So I have to find Q in. Was I given the charge? I wasn't given the charge, but I was given information about the charge. What information was I given? It's positive, and how big is it? How much charge is there? I was given a letter to represent that. A B. I was given rho. That's the charge per unit volume. So that's equal to Q in over volume. So I can solve this for Q. Q is equal to rho times Vn. There's something nice about this. These charges, this rho, is uniform. So that means the charges are uniformly spread throughout there. Okay. That, that lets us simplify this a little bit. There's another problem in your homework that doesn't have it uh, quite like that. Uh, and we'll see how to deal with that. So I have Q in is equal to rho times the volume that's enclosed. And this volume is all dependent on the charge and where the charge is. The volume that the charge is inside. Okay. So what volume is the charge inside? Well, it's inside of R. So there's actually, between B and R, is there any charge in there? No, so we can't include that volume. Between A and B, is there charge in there? Yeah, so we can include that volume. How about between 0 and A? Is there any charge in there? No, so we can't include that volume. So we need to somehow write the volume of the shell where the charge actually is. How do I do that? Just subtract. So Vn, Qn equals rho times Vn, which would be 4 thirds times pi. Now that we need the radius. What's the outer radius? Where charge actually is. Oh. Outer radius is B. Why not R? <laughs> no charge in there. So our outer radius for the where the charge actually is is B. Cute. And I subtract off A cubed. Yeah, why am I subtracting off A cubed? No charge between zero and A. So this gives me a shell that's that volume of where the sh uh, charge actually is. So there's my Q in. So I have E times 4 times pi times R squared equals rho times 4 times pi times B cubed minus A cubed all divided by 3 epsilon naught. Took this Q in, plug it into Gauss's law, and I get this. Four thirds, four thirds, pi, pi, rho, rho, B cubed minus A cubed, B cubed minus A cubed, epsilon naught. Can I simplify this? Yeah. yeah. I need to divide both sides by four pi r squared. four pi's are going to cancel and I should end up with E equals rho times B cubed minus A cubed over 3 epsilon naught R squared hopefully let's check my answer see if I did it right yep got it right so 
that's the electric field if I'm on the outside. Now let's go back and do part B. I, I think part C was a little more clear than part, part B. Uh, part B. Let's draw our sphere. There's our A. There's our B. And now we're going to do our R in face melting yellow. inside of the shell. I'm between A and B. We should be very good at this by now. Integral of E dot DA equals Q in over epsilon naught. What's the left-hand side? E times 4 pi r squared. When will that change? If I give you, if you have a shape that's not a sphere. Okay. And that has to be equal to Q in over epsilon naught. What kind of information did they give us about Q? They gave it to us in terms of rho, which was Q over V. So Q is again rho times V. So Q equals rho times V. Now I need to do where the charge is actually enclosed. What is the volume of where the charge is enclosed? What's the outer radius? R. Because I want only things that are internally to R. Do I care about between R and B? Nope, that's not enclosing any of the Gaussian surface. So R is my outer. So we have, again, the same 4 thirds times pi times R cubed. How about the inner surface? Subtract off that inner part because there's no charges in there, so we subtract off the A cubed. There's my charge. So my E times 4 pi times R squared equals rho times 4 times pi times R cubed minus A cubed, all divided by 3. Epsilon now. Four pi's will again cancel out, and my r squared I can bring down to the bottom. So e is rho times r cubed minus a cubed over three epsilon naught r squared. So that was problem number 33. That is probably the easiest example of Gauss's law that I could give you on an exam. Yeah. That's easy. That's straightforward. Would be the harder one the next one would be a little bit trickier. So actually, I think the next one, even though it would probably be trickier, I think it's easier. So the next one we'll do is 39. 39, we're given a sphere. We don't have a shell. This is a full sphere. It has a radius equal to big R. But we don't have a constant rho. Our rho changes depending on the radius. And it's equal to C divided by R. So they give us that as an equation. They give us some other equations too. They tell us that when your uh, charge density changes based on the radius, you can figure out the charge by using a, an, an integral. So the charge is equal to the integral of rho times dv. And if we're talking about a sphere, then the char, then the dv
is equal to 4 times pi times r squared dr. This is everything that's given in the problem. They give you all of this. And we can use this to find the answers. The question that was posed was specifically about part B. But we're going to go ahead and quickly do part A as well. Part A asks us to find what is the constant C. We have to find what C is, and we have to find it in terms of the other variables that we're given. So we can find this using that Q equation. Q equals the integral of C divided by R, that's the row, times DV. What do I plug in for DV? 4 pi r squared dr. How do I know that? Because they gave it to us. I'm doing an integral here. I need limits. What are the limits of this integral? 0 to what r? Big r. Why? That's how big the sphere is. If I told you the sphere has a radius of q, what would, it, what would you plug in there? q. Why would I not give you a radius equal to q? That's really freaking confusing with the Q right there. <laughs> I won't do that. So I need to do this integral. What is the variable that I'm integrating over? R. Little, r. Little r. What can I do with every other variable in there? Take it out. Pull it out. So I can take out the C, I can take out the 4, I can take out the pi. And I have integral from 0 to big R of r squared divided by r times dr. Q equals c times 4 times pi times the integral from 0 to big R of r dr. r dr. r r r. Pirate integral again. What's the integral of r dr? What's the integral of r dr? r squared over 2. Between 0 and r. So now my q equals c times 4 times pi times big r squared over 2. Minus c times 4 times pi <coughs> times 0 squared over 2. What happens to the right-hand side of that? All that is zero, so that goes away. And what am I trying to find in part A? I'm trying to find C. So I multiply everything over to the other side. I get my C is equal to Q times 2 divided by 4 times pi times big R squared. What happens with 2 and 4? They can cancel out so that I get rid of the 2 and end up with the 2 on the bottom. So C as a constant equal to Q over 2 times pi times big R squared. There's my C. I can solve that. I can find that. And that's based on all things that they literally gave you with the problem. They gave you all those pieces. They gave you everything. If I gave this to you on an exam, would I give you everything? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Why not? Why not? Can you just plug stuff in? Sure. Okay, now for part B, we actually have to find the electric field. What is E if the radius is less than big R? There's my sphere. There's my big R. And my Gaussian surface is inside of here. Could I have made that circle that's on the inside a little bit bigger? Sure. Could I have made it smaller? Sure. Doesn't matter. Whatever the heck you want. It's just to represent a surface. I want to know the electric field. I write down Gauss's law. What's Gauss's law? Integral of e dot dA equals q in over epsilon naught. What's the left-hand side going to give me? 
e times 4 pi little r squared. Now I need to find the charge that's enclosed. Ooh, how do I find the charge enclosed? Q in. What's the charge enclosed? All right, isn't it still just integral of rho dv? Yeah. Q in equals integral. What is rho? What was rho? C over r. What's dv? 4 pi r squared dr. What are my limits? Zero to what r? Little r? Why is it little r? That's where the charge is. It's enclosed within little r. Not all the way out to big r. What else can I do? Okay, I can start simplifying some things. Q in equals integral from zero to little r. Didn't I just figure out what c was? What is c? It's freaking q over 2 pi big r squared. So that's my c times 1 over little r times 4 times pi times r squared dr. I think I'm getting a skewed perspective of how much fun we're all having based on the front table. They are very excited. I don't know if you can hear them. Because we're learning. It's freaking Q over 2 pi r squared. Okay. What can I do with this? Take everything out that's not an R. I could take everything out that is not an R. Does that... I can even take out big R? Yeah. Yeah, I sure can. Heck yeah, I can. So I can take out the Q divided by 2 pi big R squared. I can take out that 1. I can take out the 4. I can take out the pi. Jeez. 0 and R of r squared over r dr. Q in equals, what happens to 4 pi divided by 2 pi? Just end up with 2. So I have 2 big Q over big r squared times the integral from 0 to little r of r dr. From a math majors, this should bother you. Your variables of integration should not be in the same as the variable that you're integrating over. There should be a little prime there or something. But do we care about that? No. No. What kind of math are we doing? Physics. Physics math. We can ignore the obnoxious mathematicians. <laughs> to give me Q, 2Q, big R squared. And what's the integral of RDR? r squared over 2. And I plug in my little r right there. What happens to my 2's? Cancel out. q in equals big Q times little r squared over big R squared. So now I go back into Gauss's law. e times 4 times pi times little r squared equals q in, which is q times little r squared over big R squared, epsilon naught. Divide both sides by 4 pi r squared. And watch your brains explode. What happens to my little r squareds? They cancel out. E equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught big Q divided by R squared. And that's the electric field due to a point charge. Big Q over R squared. We just proved that equation. KQ over R squared. Big R. Squared. That's crazy. That's freaking nuts. That's knuck and fucks, man. <laughs> it's dangerous to use such phrases on video. That was, that was on the video.
Anybody ever? Anybody watch the the show The Good Place? Oh, they can't curse there, right? They can't curse there, but but they say curse words, but they replace curse words with other words. So so they use the phrase shirt balls a lot. Mother forking shirt. Yeah, I think I'm gonna try to integrate that into all my lectures. No more curse words. Just fork. Fork. Stupid fork. Holy shirt. <laughs> All right, let's do number 61. What time are we at? Six, we got plenty of time. Number 61. So number 61, actually somebody do me a favor. Somebody that has the book open is maybe sitting right in front of me. You have the electronic Okay, Or could show me it so that I can read it. Okay, so that I can. Okay. Do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? Um, all right. Okay. Um, a point charge Q1 is at the center of two conducting spherical shells. The larger shell has a total charge Q2 on it, and the smaller shell has zero net charge. Q1. Yep. Uh, is at the center. And then we have two shells. Yeah. There's one shell. There's two shells, and we can tell from my pictures that they're perfectly spherical. Um, Wait, can you where does shell one start? Can you use a different color for the <laughs> second shell? Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> that's getting a little weird. Okay, yeah. 61. For like both, all the, all the shells. Q1. And a shell. Yes. Right here. That's shell one. Or is that Q1 shell? That's shell one. This is shell one. This is shell one. <laughs> and then we'll do shell two. Those are our two shells, and they tell us something about shell two. What do they tell us about shell two? Um, the larger shell has a total charge of Q2, and the smaller shell has zero. Okay. 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 Okay.
Maybe I will draw this in. Face melting yellow. There's my little arc. What surface am I talking about? Well, it's anything interior to this, right? So even though the conductor itself is just that tiny little piece, that means that the electric field inside of there and inside of here has to be zero. So if the electric field has to be zero, what does the charge inside of there have to be? Zero. I have charge Q1. Yep. On a conductor, all the charge doesn't reside in the conductor, it resides on the surfaces. I have an inner surface and an outer surface. So I have a bunch of charge on this inner surface. How much charge do I have on the inner surface? I want a total charge inside of that yellow of zero. Right now I have a charge Q1. How do I get rid of Q1? Oh, negative Q1. So I need negative Q1 on that small inner surface. Oh. Yeah? So Q small inner has to be negative Q1. What's the total charge on that small shell? They told us that. Zero. So if I have negative Q1 on the inner uh, inner shell, I don't have any charge in the middle. Why is there no charge in the middle inside the shell? Because it's a conductor. No shell inside of conductors. All no charge inside of the conductor. It's all on the inner or outer surface. So all the other charge has to be on the outer surface. If there's negative Q1 on the inner, how much has to be on the outer? Positive Q1, so that I get zero total charge. Okay. So that is part A. All using reasoning, no actual math. Part B. What does Part B ask? So now we're going to draw this again, Q1. That's the inner shell. That's the outer shell. I have negative Q1 on the inner surface of the inner shell, and I have positive Q1 on the outer surface. And then I draw my Gaussian surface between the two shells. So I'm between the red and the blue. Gauss's law. Integral of E dot dA equals Q over epsilon naught. What is the left-hand side? What kind of shape? Spheres. Spheres. So what is the left-hand side? E times 4 times pi times little r squared. How much charge is inside of that yellow barrier, that yellow Gaussian surface? I can follow it in. What's on the outer shell of the inner? Positive Q1. Positive Q1. What's this? Negative. Negative Q1. So what does that equal? Zero. Zero of those cancel out. And what's the middle charge? Positive Q1. So how much charge is inside of this? Q1. So the electric field from Gauss's law is Q1 over 4 pi epsilon naught little r squared. There's part B. That's it. Yeah? Okay, let's do this again. Let's do part C. What is part C asking? Um, what is the charge on the inner surface of the larger shell and on its outer surface? So now we have to deal with the outer shells. So let me draw these things again. OK. 
Okay. Now we're asked to find what's going on on the inner surface of the outer shell and the outer surface of the outer shell. So that's going to be here and here. Yeah. I can use the same reasoning I used previously. I can draw a Gaussian surface that's in the middle of this outer shell. There's my Gaussian surface. If I'm gonna go through Gauss's law and calculate what is the electric field inside of this, what's, what does that electric field have to be inside of this whole thing? This shell is a conductor, right? Yeah. What does the electric field have to be inside a conductor? Zero. zero. So how much charge has to be between this zero and this little r? How much total charge? Ignoring everything. I mean zero charge. Yeah? So Q on this shell has to be equal to this shell plus this shell plus the middle charge. Yep. So what does that equal to? This charge plus this charge plus this charge plus this charge have to add it equal to zero. Let's write that out. So that would be Q. I think I called it large. Inner. Plus this Q1, which is the charge on the, in, on the small outer shell. Plus the charge that's on the small inner shell. What is that? Negative Q1. Plus the charge that's in the very, very middle. What's that? Plus Q1. Equals zero. So these two charges cancel out. Q1 minus Q1. And I end up with Q large inner equals negative Q1. Now I know for par for the next part of this, Q large inner plus Q large outer has to be equal to Q2. How do I know that? They tell you that. There is Q2 on the outer shell. So Q large inner is negative Q1 plus Q large outer has to be equal to Q2. So Q large outer is equal to Q2 plus Q1. There's the charges on both those shells. And then part D. What does part D want? Uh, what is the electric field outside both shells a distance r from the point charge? What's the electric field outside of this whole thing? E times 4 pi r squared equals Q enclosed. How much, if I'm outside of this whole thing, how much charge is all enclosed all the way in? How much charge is on this shell? What's the total charge in this whole shell? This is blue shell. Q2, how much charge is on this inner shell? Zero, how much charge is in the middle? Q1, so how much charge is entirely? Q1 plus Q2. Q1 plus Q2 over epsilon naught. E equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Q1 plus Q2 over R squared. Have we solved today doing Gauss's law? All of them. Six. We've solved about six problems. Yep. These problems, you should not do any of them. But uh, you remember last class? How many problems did we solve last class? 
We got like two. We can solve those same problems using Gauss's law much, much quicker. Let's do, we've got five more minutes. We can do one more problem. We can do problem 67. 67 asks us for the electric flux through all these different points and it draws these pictures for us. So we have these charges, 20 coulombs, negative 10 coulombs, negative five coulombs, and negative five coulombs. And then it draws different shapes and asks us to find what's the electric flux through all of these different shapes. First of all, what's the electric flux? What's the equation for electric flux? E dot dA, which is also equal to Q in over epsilon naught. Surface A, let's say this is my surface. That's one of the surfaces they draw. What is the electric flux through that surface? 20 minus 10 over epsilon naught. The total charge divided by epsilon naught. Part A, 10 over epsilon naught. Let's look at part B. Still the same charges, but now we're looking at these ones. There's my shape. How much charge is in there? Negative five plus negative five. What's negative five plus negative five? Negative 10 over epsilon naught. Part C. 20 coulombs, negative 10 coulombs, negative five coulombs, negative five coulombs. If it's this surface, what's total charge? 20 minus 5 is 15 over epsilon naught. There's your answer. Part D. 20 coulombs, negative 10 coulombs, negative 5 coulombs, negative 5 coulombs. And they gave us all of them. What's 20 minus 5 minus 5 minus 10? Zero. What's the electric field? Zero. Okay, we still got four more minutes. That was literally with one minute. You can put that on the test. Put that on the test? I think that is so easy it would be worth negative points. Oh no, put that on I think I could put that on the exam and you get five points if you get it right, but you lose like fifty points if you get it wrong. I like that. Okay, I think that's fair. That seems reasonable. That's nice. You know what? Yeah. yeah. If I do me, that just gives you all A's. That's my natural inclination. Yes. Oh, that's recorded too. Oh. <laughs>